started here in just a moment. Just want to make sure we don't start too early. It's almost two o'clock. This is always the awkward part of webinars when uh, people are just joining in and we can't see your faces and certainly miss that. Although with 249 people having jumped on already, uh, we wouldn't have been able to fit all of you in our auditorium. So we're still reaching more people than, than we could have if we had had this live, even though I miss, miss seeing all of you in person. So it's two o'clock now, Nora. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can get everything started. Sounds great, Julie. Hi. To no one who knows me, um, my name is Nora Serbao, and I'm the new president of the Hardy Plant Society. And I want to thank everyone for being here on behalf of the Hardy Plant Society Mid-Atlantic Group. And in collaboration with the Scott Arboretum, we bring you our annual Joanne Walkovic Memorial Lecture. Ah, so I've had my first little hiccup. I'm going to stop share and restart share, okay? Because clearly I have a little issue with. Sometimes I find, Nora, if my cursor isn't on the PowerPoint, I have trouble advancing. Yeah, and, and that's sort of where we started. And there we go. So we'll try that again. So going to our next slide, ta-da. Joanne Walkovic um, was one of our founders. Hardy Plant Society is a nonprofit. And in 1986, Joanne and Jean Schumacher um, decided they wanted to start the Hardy Plant Society. Joanne is a, was a fashion designer and a very avid gardener in Philadelphia. And Jean was a horticulturist and former assistant director of the Tyler Arboretum. And she was also at the American Horticultural Society in their Plant Science Data Center. The women persuaded well-known garden experts and educators to lend weight to the organization. And membership has climbed ever since. Today, we have more than 700 members. In 2000, while visiting gardens and nurseries in England, Joanne was tragically killed in an automobile accident. The Hardy Plant Society commemorates her in this yearly lecture. Jean, with her husband, Phil, continues to tend her garden in Wallingford. This lecture is a reflection of what Hardy Plant Society has stressed from the start, education. But in addition to the free lecture like today's, we host an annual garden symposium our March into spring. <coughs> it will be virtual this year and will be on Saturday, March 20th. The speakers for that event will include our much loved Ken Drews, who has been a Walkovic lecturer in the past, as well as Thomas Christopher from Wave Hill and Kim Ironman, who will discuss pollinator victory gardens. Visit our website to learn more about this event and to register. February 1st is the deadline for a discounted fee. In conjunction with these great speakers, we will be selling their books online at bargain prices, which are lower than Amazon's. And we will have an online auction with awesome offerings and experiences from regional gardens, nurseries, and well-known garden personalities. We are also dedicated in assisting organizations and communities in their endeavors through our grant program. Since its inception in 2000, we have given thousands of dollars in small grants to deserving recipients. If you know of programs that might be in need of funds, the deadline to apply is February 1st. Visit our website, hardyplant.org, for details and an application. Perks of membership include all kinds of events and tours exclusive to the members. We organize tours, both domestic and international. Members will often open their private gardens to fellow members, and we have annual receptions and an awesome hospitality team, which we hope to reinvigorate this year. We, we arrange shopping days at area wholesale nurseries and organize a major plant sale with vendors from up and down the Eastern Seaboard. 
Our quarterly newsletter features articles by members and professional garden writers alike. We offer workshops for beginners and have special interest groups like native plant and tender perennials. We will have, as you see on the screen, Tuesdays at 10, a program series beginning at this coming Tuesday. It is a members only event, so join in. Our member only garden tour in late June will be held in Roxborough area of Philadelphia this summer. And yes, we are planning to hold it. In addition, we offer both common and rare seeds through our members only online seed shop. Members contribute, clean, and pack seeds for distribution and sale to members only. Seeds come from member organizations like Wave Hill or Norfolk Botanical and even from Plant Delights, as well as from individual members in our organization. The deadline for shopping is January 21st. So if you're not a member, we urge you to join us and join in. With increasing distribution of the vaccine and spring coming, we will once again emerge to laugh together and plant together. Be part of an organization that shares your passion. And if you love today's lecture, which I'm quite sure you will, we, we have Doug's book. Visit our website. And just for the record, it's cheaper than Amazon. So thank you very much, Julie, and looking forward to hearing you, Doug. Thanks so much, Nora. I'm sure the Hardy Plant Society is thrilled to have you be their new president. So um, thank you again to you and to the Hardy Plant Society Mid-Atlantic Chapter for collaborating with us on yet another wonderful lecture that I know we're all gonna enjoy today. And I wanna say welcome to everyone from across the country. I know that many people are joining in from many states today um, uh, for a co-sponsored webinar today. I'm Julie Jenny, the Educational Programs Coordinator for the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. And helping out today is Mandy Curtis Banks, our Education Programs and Events Assistant. Mandy will be keeping track of any questions you might have throughout the program today. So please feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A at any time, and she will read them to Doug at the end of the program. Now we have so many people joining in today that I should say we might not be able to get to all of your questions. So I would just say, please, consider your questions carefully, uh, have them be relevant to the topic and to the group as a whole, if you could, that would be really, uh, we'd appreciate that. So for the Scott Arboretum, we have a long list of excellent free virtual programs between now and mid-March. From cooking classes to yoga, to our lunchtime travelogue series, Travels at 12, which begins on January 21st. So I encourage you to find those, of, those events um, under the tab events on our website, scottarboretum.org. I'd also like to take this opportunity to note that the Scott Arboretum is offering all of our virtual programs for free, certainly not to undercut any other public garden institutions, but because it's the only way for us to reach people right now since our grounds are closed to visitors at this time. It is also, and thanks to the generosity of the associates of the Scott Arboretum, and for this particular webinar, the Hardy Plant Society Mid-Atlantic Chapter. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Doug Tallamy and to welcome him back to the Scott Arboretum. Although, as you all know, he's not actually at the Scott Arboretum. None of us are right now, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, he's brought us another large, uh, wonderful crowd. Doug Tallamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 95 research publications and has taught insect related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, was published in 2014. Doug's new book, as Nora mentioned, as Nature's Best Hope, and it was published by Timber Press in February 2020. Among his awards are the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHSBY Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. 
I'm sure many of you have read Doug's work and that is what has brought you here today. And while we can't hear you clap, please help me give a very, very warm welcome to Doug Tallamy. So Doug, I will now turn it over to you. Thanks again for being here today. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Julie, sorry. <laughs> um, well, thanks for joining me today. Uh, if you can, try to put the events of last week out of your mind. Let's, let's all sit and watch wonderful creatures like these Promethea moths here. Uh, and talk about how we can actually increase insect populations on all the property that we own. That is not a typical goal of gardens, but um, it's going to become that, I hope. So I want to talk to you about, uh, this would be a guide to restoring these little things that run the world. That term, of course, is not mine. That comes from E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, uh, Professor Emeritus at Harvard, certainly the most famous entomologist of all time, I guess, certainly our time, one of the most famous biologists. I could give you an entire lecture on all of the accomplishments of, of E.O. Wilson. And I was lucky enough to meet him twice um, in my career. Once was uh, way back in 1982. I just got my job at the University of Delaware and there was a small conference on social insects. Of course, E.O. Uh, studies ants at Boulder, Colorado. And it was a small venue. So uh, after talks, there was no place for people to mill around. So everybody would go outside. And I went outside after the morning talks and here's, here's Ed Wilson sitting on the curb alone. And nobody was sitting next to him. I'm actually a shy guy, but I got up my nerve and I said, I gotta take advantage of this. I went over, sat down next to, to uh, this great man. And he turned and looked at me and he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met. I said, no, we haven't met. And we shook hands and talked for a while. And it was very nice. Well, that was the end of break. Then there were more talks and there was lunch and more talks. And then there was another break in the afternoon and I went outside and here's E.O. Wilson sitting on the, on the curb and nobody's sitting next to him. So I went over, we were buddies now. So I went over, I sat down next to him and he turned, he looked at me and he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met. That was the first time I met him. Second time I met him was 32 years later when he was receiving the Ben Franklin Award at the Academy of National Sciences in Philadelphia. I met Ben too, but I was more excited to see CEO. I didn't remind him that we were buddies. He was getting this award because uh, to celebrate a lifetime of achievement in science, but it really was focused on a lifetime of effort to save life on planet Earth. Um, Wilson has done more to do that than almost anybody else. And he's still doing this, he still writes a book a year. One of the first things he did was to write this paper in 1987 talking about the importance of insects and called the little things that run the world. And his message was very, very clear. He said, life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants on the planet. And if we lost the flowering plants, it would drastically change how energy flows through our terrestrial ecosystems, which would collapse the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, and even many of our freshwater fish all depend on insects. Uh, and the plants that create them. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and we'd only have uh, bacteria and fungi to do that job. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. So it was a, it was a somber message, but um, it was largely theoretical. This was 1987 and nobody was really worried about living, losing insects. As a matter of fact, we were much more concerned about how we could kill them. And besides, if we if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? I mean, this is this has been our focus. Now that was that was 1929, but it was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. Notice it doesn't say pests, just all insects gone. And that's pretty much the what the way our society has viewed insects uh, ever since. Even if we succeed in killing all the insects in agriculture, and we understand why we might need to do that, uh, or at home. Uh, we'll talk about why we, we really don't need to do that. Most people don't worry about losing insects because we still think that they are common in our natural areas. Well, there are two reasons why that is really no longer true. And one of them is we don't have enough natural areas. This is what the, the uh, night uh, map, the light map of the US looks like at night, um, just demonstrating you know, we're everywhere. We're everywhere and the natural areas aren't everywhere anymore because we have turned those natural areas into our cities. They are not designed to support insects, into our suburbs, which aren't designed to support anything, including people. 
Uh, even our rural areas, you know, we think of them as the country, but they're not designed to support insects. We've got agriculture, 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. That's designed to support cattle, which as you can see in most places, it's grossly over overgrazed. Uh, and again, not very good for insects. As a matter of fact, agriculture now claims uh, almost half of the Earth's terrestrial surface. And of course, these areas are not designed to support insects. The second reason that our natural areas aren't doing a good job with insects is that uh, in, in most places, and I mean most places, they are heavily invaded with plants from other continents. Uh, and much of it looks like this. This is a picture of White Clay Creek State Park in uh, Newark, Delaware. And I took this picture in March when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see there is a non-native plant, which is very poor at supporting insects. And we'll talk about why. About a third of the vegetation in White Clay Creek State Park and most of our natural areas are introduced plants that aren't supporting our insects. Where these plants come from, you know, most of them come from our gardens. They're escape bees. We've got multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and miscanthus and calorie pear and, and uh, privet and barberry and everything else that I can't remember. Porcelain berry, they're all there. Um, and again, most of the vegetation in these natural areas is doing a poor job at supporting insects. So um, this, is, this is one of the take homes. Invasive plants destroy insect populations, which is one of the main reasons we, we really shouldn't tolerate these things. And we've got over 3,300 species of introduced plants in the US at this point. Now, when I was young, and many of you were young, uh, I think you all were young at some point, um, you remember pictures like this. This is what lights used to look like at night. Uh, they were, you know, insects flying around all the time. This was commonplace. Look at lights this summer. You hardly see anything. And this is what our windshields looked like. It was a pain in the neck, but it demonstrated there were a lot of insects flying around out there. And we just don't see that anymore. So we're winning this war against insects. Uh, and that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Uh, and a great deal of data is coming in very quickly now that, that people are alerted and starting to measure it. Um, so for example, one of the first things we worried about are our bees, starting with the honeybee, but then, then thinking about our native bees. 50% of our, our Midwestern native bee species have disappeared from their historic ranges in the last, last century. We've got four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. So they're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They're no longer common enough to be doing, performing their roles in their ecosystems. We've got three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct. People argue about it, but they haven't seen them, you know, and who knows how long. So again, functionally extinct. And 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Uh, more research has, has occurred in, in uh, Europe than in the US, and the news is not good. 30% of the Europe's European orthopterans, the grasshoppers, the katydids, and crickets are facing extinction. A lot of bad news coming out of England where they like to measure everything, um, losing their butterflies uh, and their, their moths, um, some of which are already extinct. Uh, the biggest study came out of Germany. Uh, flying insects are declining 79% since 1989. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have already disappeared. From Germany. And here's the big one, invertebrate abundance around the globe has declined 45% since, since 1974. And as insects decline, so do the things that require them. Now we're just starting to get the data to tie these things together, but it's pretty logical. You take away the food and the things that depend on them are going to disappear as well. We've got 432 species of North American birds threatened with extinction for a number of reasons, uh, but lack of insects got to be one of them. There are 3 billion fewer breeding birds today in North America than actually that should be 50 years ago. Um, that came out, that study came out just in, in uh, 2019. Um, the house sparrow and starling, both invasive species here, are now, now uh, red listed in England. They're just about ready to disappear because England has, has uh, uh, sterilized the countryside so much, these guys no longer have anything to eat. Uh, we went and took a look at the, the data from uh, Rosenberg et al. That was a study that, that uh, said we've lost 3 billion birds. And separated the birds into two groups, the ones that require insects at some part of their life history and the ones that don't. 
So things like uh, the finches, the, you know, the doves and the finches that can actually reproduce on seeds, they actually gained some numbers in the last 50 years. Uh, but the, the birds that require insects have lost on average 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. This does not prove cause and effect, uh, but it certainly suggests there is a direct relationship. Uh, and now the UN tells us that uh, we're, we're on track to lose a million species to extinction, possibly within the next 20 years. I love the way they, re they report this as if it's just one more headline. They might as well say we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it doesn't matter. This is not an option, folks. It is not an option to lose a million species and, and to still have everything function well on, on planet Earth. So does it matter? Of course it matters. These are the creatures that keep us alive. And we've already lost at least 45% of them. Not good. So how do we get people to, to react? Well, we have proven time and again that we humans are terrible at reacting to what we consider to be long-term risks. We hear it. I mean, look at our response to climate change. You know, we're still denying that it exists. Um, so I'm, I'm not looking for an immediate reaction uh, based on the actual risks that are there, but um, we're not bad at actually feeling protective of other animals. So I want to, I want to play a little game here. I want you to think that about Pretend you are this bird, a magnolia warbler, which is an insectivore, depends on insects. So what are the consequences of, of reduced insect populations to you, the magnolia warbler? Okay, you're a magnolia warbler. You just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica, and it is time for you to fly north so that you can reproduce. In other words, you're going to migrate. And migration is the most dangerous thing you're ever going to do. Predation risks are very high, but the physiological costs are enormous. You got to fly across the Gulf of, of Mexico. Um, you're going to lose 35% of your body weight while you're doing that. Uh, a couple of years ago, somebody did a study of what tiger sharks are, are eating in the Gulf during migration, and their stomachs are loaded with migrating birds that didn't make it. They just crash into the ocean, and that's the end of them. Once they reach land, they continue their migration. Most of them breed much farther north, uh, and every time they have a big flight, which can be up to 300 miles uh, in a single night, they're losing 35 to 50 percent of their, of their body weight. So they stop at what we call stopover points, and they say to rest, but it's really to gas up. They're going to the gas station. They do that by eating insects. All right, so migration is tough. If migration is so hard though, why did it evolve? Why don't they just stay in the tropics and reproduce there? Well, migration would only evolve if the benefits of migration outweighed the costs. That's the way, that's the way it works. Nothing would evolve if the costs outweighed the benefits. So what are the benefits of migrating? Well, migrants have more food. In the spring, in the temperate zone, you have this giant flush of brand new leaves uh, and that is followed by a giant flush of the things that eat those leaves, uh, particularly caterpillars. And that's what's fueling uh, bird life in so many places. That does not happen in the tropics. Most of the tropics are very steady. Um, competition is really uh, intense. So you don't have this single bonanza worth of, of flush of food. Um, and that bonanza that occurs farther north gave any, any bird that, that um, found its way north a huge opportunity in terms of breeding. Instead of rearing just two to four offspring per year in the tropics, they were able to rear three to six offspring per year because of the enhanced food that was up there. So this is what balances those huge costs of migration. It's the ability to reproduce more. If they make it, they can make more babies. And I want to emphasize that migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects seasonally available in the temperate zone. How many insects are we talking about? Well, this paper came out uh, two years ago. I don't know how they measured it, but they, they estimated that birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. And it's funny how they presented it. It's not funny. Uh, it was the same old thing. All insects are pests, you know. So they said, well, birds are going to be great at controlling insects. Let's rewrite that and just say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if we reduce the amount of insects that are out there, you're going to reduce the amount of birds. So when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone. Is that still true today? Do we have enough insects in the temperate zone to justify migration? Well, every time we measure it, the answer is no. Let's just look at, at the impact of uh, many of the introduced plants that we have on insect declines. Uh, I did a, uh, well, we've been studying this for you know the last 18 years or so. We've got a lot of papers demonstrating that non-native plants reduce insect population, but this was a very simple one. Simply went into the, the uh, field with an undergrad and measured caterpillar 
biomass diversity and, and abundance in hedgerows that were invaded by non-native plants. So here you got a lot of autumn olive and, and multiflora rose, they're all, all there. And compared caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were not invaded. So the tough part was finding, finding these guys, but there are still a few left. And what we found is that there's a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in those invaded hedgerows, 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those, those caterpillars. That's the amount of energy available for, for birds to eat, 96% reduction. Who does this affect? You know, it's not just a few birds that are migrating south and need all these insects. There's 386 species of neotropical migrants that may no longer have enough insects to justify that migration that they're now genetically locked into, by the way. And you're talking about our swallows and our swifts and our orioles and our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings, flycatchers, our thrushes, all of those warblers, uh, night jars, uh, bobolinks, they're all, all doing it. And don't forget the, the resident birds that are not migrating. They're here over the winter time, things like, like chickadees. But when, they, uh, when it comes time to reproduce, they're not eating seeds anymore. They're eating insects, just like those migrants. migrants. And remember, it takes thousands of, of caterpillars to produce a single nest of a small bird like a chickadee. Six to 9,000 caterpillars to get those, those baby birds to the point where they, they leave the nest. Baby birds can't eat seeds in most cases. They have to eat insects. Those insects are typically caterpillars. And after they leave the nest, uh, they, uh, the parents continue to feed them another 21 days. And they're flying all around so nobody's been able to, to count them. So it's really, it's many more caterpillars than this required to create a bird that's a third of an ounce. Uh, a, a, a wonderful study by my, my graduate student Desiree Narango in the, within the boundary of the Beltway in Washington, D.C., looked at how chickadee populations respond to the landscape in which they're trying to breed. So what she did was compare landscapes that were dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by non-native plants and studied how the chickadees responded and where they did their foraging. And this is what a typical uh, nest looked like. The nest is where the, the uh, star is. The red line represents uh, where, within which, that's the territory, the foraging territory. They did 95% of their foraging within that red line. And the blue areas are the trees on which they did that 95% of the foraging. And if we look at what they are, they're all the native trees in this area. So basswood, sweet gum, American elm, blackberry, and two species of oaks were enough to get this chickadee family through to maturity. There were a lot of other trees in that neighborhood, though, uh, and uh, they, weren't, they weren't used for foraging at all. So Japanese maples, silk trees, ginkgos, black poplars, crepe myrtles, saucer magnolia. These are all from Asia. Why aren't the chickadees foraging there? There's nothing there. They foraged there as long as you would go to shop, right, if all the, all the uh, shelves were bare. Um, so the birds do recognize where the food is. They go to where the food is. It's not just the, the uh, resident birds. Here's the migrants in her study. There were 51 species of migrants that came down and rested, used them as stopover points during her study. Uh, and if they came down in the land of ginkgo, they were out of luck because ginkgo's making zero caterpillars. Um, if you've ever seen a, a bird during migration just sitting on the ground shivering, um, it's probably the end of its, its road because it didn't find enough to eat. A lot of people say, I don't have a property big enough to support breeding birds, and that might be true. But if you have a property big enough to support a single tree and you make it the right tree, um, you can support migrating birds and they will take advantage, believe me. What if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 60, 96%. I think you would immediately get it. That's not good. Not something we can tolerate. You know, we live off of our, our bank account. Insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And it's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. This is serious stuff. It's hard to get people to, to appreciate that, but we cannot afford to lose our insects, not just because of the, the birds, but because of ourselves. <clears throat> so our only viable option is to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, and that's what I want to talk about. How do we do that? Let's first talk about where we're going to do it. Um, we want to do it everywhere, but we cannot ignore private property. In other words, where you live, where you work, where you play, private property, 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 
if we don't do conservation on these areas, we're going to fail because that means we're only doing it on 15% on of the land and that's not nearly enough. So here's a typical, uh, uh, that's a suburban home. I was up in a helicopter, took this picture. It is, it is good looking. I mean, here's the guy mowing. Where is he? He's right there. Um, but I, I wager every single one of these plants is a non-native plant and it is not designed to support insects. So how do we change a landscape like this so that it could support insects? Well, in order to do that, we have to understand what are the causes of insect declines. Dave Wagner at the University of, of Connecticut uh, has, has uh, likened uh, insect declines to death by a thousand cuts. There are a lot of reasons insects are declining. The misuse and overuse of pesticides, habitat loss, you know, you hear that for everything. You take away what they need, a place to live and something to eat, and of course they decline. Or, you know, our profligate use of, of non-native ornamentals that then escape and become invasive species in our natural areas. Remember, these guys are not supporting insects really well. Light pollution turns out to be a really uh, important factor. And of course, climate change is hitting insects very hard. What's interesting is the first, what is this? First five causes here are something individuals can deal with. This is actually good news because we as individuals can attack each one of these and make a difference on the property that we can manipulate. I'm not gonna assign changing climate change so that you fix it by tomorrow, but you can do a lot of these things by tomorrow and, and start to in, improve the, the future of our, our insects. And we're gonna talk about how you can do that. In general, we're talking about raising the bar for what we ask our landscapes to do. This is a house down the street from me and uh, he loves his lawn. He's really good. He's got uh, making a good lawn, uh, but uh, it's a dead space. In the past, the criteria for choosing plants for our landscapes has all focused on aesthetics. We want to use plants as decorations because they are wonderful decorations. So we go to the nursery, you find something that's, that's pretty. Maybe it can be a screen or an anchor or focal point, but it's all been about aesthetics with no thought to the ecological role that these plants could be playing on our, our properties. And when we think of plants just as decorations, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. This is a beautiful landscape, but it is not a functioning ecosystem. We could in fact find beautiful plants that produce we, what we call ecosystem services that are supporting food webs, protecting our watershed, storing carbon, creating pollinator habitat, supporting natural enemies, doing all kinds of things. Um, and if we included function, as one of the criteria used to select plants, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. I think landscapes like this, uh, I would love to see this become uh, commonplace as, as 21st century landscaping. We've done 20th century landscaping and we're now in the sixth great extinction. So I wouldn't call that a great success. Let's give 21st century landscaping a try and see how we do. Does that have to do with making insects? You can't restore ecosystems without restoring insect populations, impossible. So we have to restore insect populations. What does it take to make insects? Same thing it takes to make everything that's alive and that is energy from the sun. If you are looking for a miracle on planet earth, I would start with photosynthesis. It is plants that allows us to eat sunlight. And imagine trying to do that without plants. It'd be hard, It'd be hard. Plants are taking, of course, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, that's good, uh, and water, making oxygen, that's good too. And now the energy from, from uh, the sun is tied up in the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is food. That is the food that drives almost all of the life on planet Earth. So let's just say plants are making all the food. So if, if we're going to have insects, first we have to have plants. That's good. We love plants. We need to have, have a lot of them. Which insects do we want to make? There are a lot of choices out there. We've got three to four million species of insects worldwide. I say three to four because uh, we only have about 1.5 that are described. Most of them still remain undescribed. We've got 164,000 species of insects in the U.S. Many more, well not, there are many that are still undescribed. I can still find an undescribed species uh, in my yard almost any time I look. And so can, so can you. So we're not going to support all these insects in our yard. Which ones should we focus on? Uh, well, I'm going to argue today that the two most important insect groups are the insects that maintain plant diversity because plants are, that's the first trophic level. It all starts with plants. The insects that help those plants get along, plus the insects that then take energy from those plants and distribute it out the food web. Those are going to be the two most important groups of plants. We're talking about pollinators and we're talking about caterpillars. Who says these are the two most important groups? 
I do, and I'm giving this talk, so we're going to go with that. Um, somebody somewhere is going to argue, oh, no, there's other, there's, and there's lots of important groups of insects for sure, but let's just focus on leaves, and let's start with pollinators. Let's start with, with why we need pollinators. You hear all the time, you need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's a really anthropocentric view of why we need pollinators, and it's not even accurate. May Berenbaum, the University of uh, Illinois, has looked at that statistic and wondered where it comes from because there's, there's really no support for it. She estimates that uh, with our current diet, uh, they actually are, are uh, essential for about a twelfth of, of uh, the food that we eat, 12%. Yeah, 12%. Um, so let's let's forget about agriculture. But a lot of people think if they don't live next to a farm, they don't need to produce uh, pollinators, and that's just just not so. Um, pollinators are important for 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants on planet Earth. If we were to lose our pollinators, and we are losing them, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. Nothing to do with agriculture. It's not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere where we need plants which is everywhere. I'm not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. All right, now we need to know what is a pollinator. You know, most of the insects that go to flowers are flower visitors. They're not actually transferring pollen uh, to the, the female parts of, of the flower. Um, and it doesn't mean they're not important parts of, of the ecosystem, but um, when people see a whole bunch of things on their flowers, they get very excited, they're helping all the pollinators. Uh, in most cases, not, not so. Our major pollinators include the honeybee, which is an introduced species. It is excellent at pollinating many of the crops that are also introduced, but we have 4,000 species of native bees that did the vast majority of pollination in North America before we brought over the honeybee. And we've got uh, an estimated 14,000 species of moths and butterflies. Now, in general, moths and butterflies are not as good at pollinating as are our bees. Um, although there are a number of specialized relationships where plants depend entirely on particular moth species. But there's so many of them and they do a lot of pollinating at night uh, when we're not watching that they're more important than most people have recognized in the past. Let's first talk about these, these uh, native bees. Um, and now we have to talk about what is a bee? You know, I, I say we need to increase native bee populations right at home, right in our yards. And people say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get stung. And I say, well, no, no, you're not going to get stung because our native bees, 90% of them are solitary. They're not protecting a hive. Uh, they're not aggressive. You can pet them while they're foraging and they, they're not going to sting you. And they say, well, that's wrong because I got stung last week. And what they're really talking about is getting stung by a wasp, by a yellow jacket or a paper wasp or a bald faced hornet. Those guys aren't bees. Those are wasps. They are predators. They're eating the caterpillars that I like so much. And I'm not talking about increasing their populations at home. I'm talking about increasing true native bees that are not predators. They are seeking pollen and nectar from flowers. Uh, and they really are safe. They're not, they're not going to sting. The, one, the, the bee that's going to sting you most often is that introduced honeybee because it is protecting a big hive and they can get aggressive if you get near that, that hive. So how do we make native bees? You know, simple. Got to give them a place to eat and something to, or something to eat and a place to, to live. That's all they need. So let's talk about where native bees nest. Three main places, we've got ground nesters and then a lot of species nest in woody stems or they nest in pithy stems. Let's talk about the ground nesters first because it's most of the native bees. 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. And this is what a typical native bee nest looks like. You might walk by and see a hole and think it's an ant hill, but, um, and you see these very often. I mean, they're there throughout the season, but you see them often in the spring when there's not much uh, vegetation. Uh, this is a Calides uh, bee, that's a female, they're all females. They're very shy, if a shadow hits them, they dive back into their, their hole. And a lot of times they fly around over trying to, to orient so they can find it again. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, they're coming to get me. They're not coming to get you. They sink a, a central shaft and then make side shafts out to the, to the uh, side and then pack them full of pollen, lay an egg on them, and that's how they, they reproduce. Um, so if you, if your property actually includes ground, uh, you can help ground nesting bees, and I'll bet that it does. If you have a slight south facing slope, um, they prefer that because it warms up, particularly in the spring, warms up first. Uh, it's got to be fairly dry, can't be underwater. Um, they do like 
uh, sandy loam that's easy to dig in. But there are species of bees that can nest and actually prefer to nest in the toughest clay soil. So almost any soil will, will do. Pithy stem nesters hollow out the center of stems that are easy to hollow out. Either they begin uh, as hollow stems uh, or that's just pith that's easily removed. This is a picture from Heather Holmes showing what happens. They make cells and they pack them full of pollen and then they lay an egg, the egg hatches and this is what a, a bee larva looks like. It's just kind of like a little worm. Uh, and it eats that pollen. This one's the oldest, so it's the biggest. This one's uh, not quite as old, not quite as big. This one's even younger. And then they go right down the line. Uh, and when they mature, they tunnel out through the edge of the, the uh, stem and they leave a, a hole. So what are we talking about by pithy stems? We're talking about all those stems that right now out in our natural areas, you know, they're, they look like dead meadows. Oh, we should have cleaned it up. Well, that's where there's a lot of, of uh, um, overwintering bees. And it's one of the reasons we don't want to clean it up. The other reason is that these seeds, so this is goldenrod and, and uh, Enothera, evening primrose, um, you know, lots of, of uh types of plants make seeds that the overwintering birds require. So if you're going to clean up something like this, doing it in March is much better than doing it in October because the birds get to eat the seeds during the winter. But um, we'll talk about when to actually clean it up if you're going to try to save those bees. This is what a woody stem nester looks like. Elderberry is a great uh, option for woody stem nesters because elderberry wood is really soft. They can, they can tunnel in there pretty easily. And this is after they've emerged right down uh, a line. But think about how we, how we treat dead stems on our elderberry or anything else. The first thing we do is prune it out because, oh, it's dead, you gotta get rid of it. It looks, looks bad. It is a resource for our overwintering bees. Well, our bees during the summer as well. So most, most uh, human dominated habitats are very poor in what we call coarse woody debris. We get rid of it, um, but we have invented what we call bee hotels of all kinds. And humans in particular love bee hotels. And some humans really love them. They go to great extent. And the bees do, the bees love them as well. They do use them. Um, what they do is they, they uh, these are pre-drilled at all different sizes and all different kinds of bees can, can uh, pack them with pollen and nest in them. Uh, there is a downside though that we have to be aware of. There's research that has shown that when you make large bee hotels, uh, you're essentially putting all your bees in one, one basket. In one place in your yard, all the bees have to nest in this single place. And if a predator or a disease finds them, uh, it can go crazy. It is much better to have small bee hotels. They may not be as spectacular and fun to play with as, as humans, but um, scatter these throughout your yard so that you're not putting all your bees in, in one basket. And if a predator or disease finds it, it doesn't wipe them all out. Um, here's a, a real easy thing. I tried this in the last spring. I just went uh, around my yard and, and cut off, I don't even know what these things were. Maybe it was, maybe it was golden round, but I don't think so. It was something, I just cut them off. Notice that the stems are, are all hollow, um, maybe a foot long and tied a string around them and then put them on top of my wood pile underneath uh, eaves so that they, they wouldn't get wet. And two of them were occupied by, by bees. And they're right there now, they're overwintering. Uh, so these guys will emerge in the, uh, in the spring. You know, it took me about five minutes to make one of these, no drills or anything else. Uh, easiest thing to do. And you can make a lot of them and scatter them all over your property. Okay, we, that's where they live, but they need to reproduce. What do bees need to reproduce? They need food, they need pollen, they need nectar, and they need it all the time. Uh, here's a study by Jared Fowler looking at the distribution of native bee species in New England. They're around from March all the way to November in New England where it's cold. Uh, and most of them are around May and June, but we want all of these species and we want food for them uh, until they, they play out their entire life cycle, which means we have to have blooming things around the pretty much the entire season. And the farther south you go, maybe even the entire year. Which species of plants should we plant for, for native bees? This is really important. Sam Drogi, he's Mr. Native Bee, works at Patuxent Wildlife uh, Research Center. He says, we have to meet, meet the needs of our specialists, our bee specialists. About a third of our 4,000 species of native bees can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant, which is usually a genus, a plant genus. 
Uh, if we plant plants to meet the needs of those specialists, we've got a lot of species around. The generalist can use those plants as well. But if we only plant for the generalist, we can use a lot of plants, including a lot of non-native plants, we've eliminated all those specialists. Why do bees specialize? Remember, bees are, are this is a true mutualism between the plant and the, the bee species. The plant wants its pollen moved very efficiently to uh, from the, the uh, male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower. So they make little little nungies here on, on the pollen grains that are just right to fit the hairs on particular species of bees. Um, they flower at a particular time, they smell a particular way. Um, their, their pollen and flower, flower morphology is species specific. Uh, and they, they have, um, very specific nutritional value. And bees, because of all these differences, they can, they can specialize on particular types of plants uh, and become the primary pollinator. Everybody else is visiting that plant as a poor pollinator and um, actually robbing pollen most of the time. Uh, so here are the best uh, plant genera for, for um, bees in Pennsylvania. And this, of course, varies as you move around the, the country. Anything in the Asteraceae is, uh, is really good. But our, our perennial sunflowers, any of our, our asters, goldenrods, they're all in the Asteraceae, golden tops, stiff goldenrod. Willows are really good because they, first of all, they come out in the spring, the early spring. And we've got a lot of early, early season bees when there's very few flowers out. Uh, and a number of species depend on, on willows. Um, so these aren't, aren't, well, they're kind of ranked, but um, there's a lot of species that, um, of plants that service only one or two species of bees. So a good diversity of plants is, is important. For example, um, the plant I'm having a senior moment about the little one that blooms in the spring and the ground, I'll think of it later on, has only one species of, of, of bee that it, that it supports. Spring beauties, you want spring beauties because there's a bee that, that depends on it. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about, about pollinators at this point, that's enough to, to keep us busy. What about, what about caterpillars? How are we gonna make caterpillars? And again, why do we need to make caterpillars? This has been our enemy, remember? You gotta, gotta kill all the caterpillars in your, your yard. Uh, well, they're the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. When we kill all the caterpillars, we are killing the machine that transfer energy from plants to other animals. Caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals. And if they don't do it, most of the energy is locked up in the plant and then the plant dies and it, and it hasn't supported anything. Um, most, the reason that is, is because most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants and that's something typically is caterpillars. So we need to make, make caterpillars. How do we do that? How do we increase caterpillar numbers in our, our yard? Um, again, not too hard. You add caterpillars by adding the plants that make those caterpillars. Uh, there is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. This is elderberry, by the way. It's a great pollinator plant, makes almost no caterpillars at all. You wouldn't choose it to, to uh, be a primary member of your, your food web. Um, so we have to use the plants that do make a lot of caterpillars. Why don't uh, plants make a lot of caterpillars? Why don't most plants make a lot of caterpillars? Because most caterpillars are really fussy about what they can eat because most plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from, from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the plants of the world most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna to, want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They're too well protected. But insects do eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around the chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. 90% of the ins that insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They pick one or two plant lineages over evolutionary time and get really good at getting around the plant defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify the defensive compounds. They develop behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those particular compounds. Um, but again, it takes a long time for all of those, those adaptations to fall into place. And that's why our insects are so poor at eating our introduced plants. They haven't been here long enough. And by a long time, I don't mean 10 years, I mean thousands of years. That's what all the data suggests. 
So for example, a crepe myrtle, great decoration, but nothing, you know, essentially nothing eats it. So it's not part of the, the food web. <clears throat> All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to, to uh, rebuild the insect populations on most of our human dominated landscapes, we got to pick the plants that are going to be good at doing that. So if I want to have this beautiful moth at home, the Pandora Sphinx, I got to plant Virginia creeper because that is the plant most likely to support its larval development. If I want the tulip tree silk moth, I've got to have tulip tree. If I want luna moths, now luna moths, I say, oh, that's a generalist. They eat a lot of things. Geographically, they do. But in any one location, it's usually only one or two plants. And in our area, it's sweet gum. Without sweet gum, you're not going to have luna moths. Um, zebra swallowtail. I wanted zebra swallowtail at our, our house. I think it's our prettiest swallowtail. But you got to have pawpaws. So we planted pawpaws. Took nine years, but they finally came. That's the only thing they eat. Many things eat our native grapes, like the eight-spotted forester moth and many other things. A lot of things eat our native viburnums, like the green marvel. Who wouldn't want the green marvel? Goldenrod supports 110 species of cat caterpillars. And that means, you know, which goldenrod, they're all doing it. Uh, like beautiful things like the brown hooded owlet, even poison ivy is supporting specialist uh, moths, like the beautiful utilia. And people say, well, you know, I can't have poison ivy because I might get poison ivy. You know when you get poison ivy? You get poison ivy when you try to get rid of poison ivy. Learn what the three leaves look like and just ignore it. Actually, when it grows up on the side of your tree with all those hairs and makes berries, it's one of the excellent berry producers for uh, our migrating birds. Persimmons make the sculptured moths. These are just examples of the, of the creatures that these plants support. The Hebrew on black gum, our beleaguered ashes make a number of, of important sphinx moths like the, the beautiful fawn sphinx. I think that's art in the garden right there. Maples are important. Rosy maple moth, beautiful rosy maple moth. The royal walnut moth on walnut and hickory. Uh, this, this beautiful moth is already extirpated from New England. So these things are disappearing. You gotta put the plants they need back. Double tooth prominent on elm. Elm's another really important plant. Witch hazel doesn't support all that much, but uh, it does support the witch hazel dagger moth. Imperial moth on pines. Pines are good. Even our native clematis supports some specialists like the spotted thyrus. Ironwood supports the two-toned two anthyllus. Uh, lost owlet on button bush. Native willows support a lot of things like the herald. Snowberry clear wing on coral honeysuckle. Not the, not the uh, Japanese honeysuckle, but coral honeysuckle. Beautiful evening primrose moth, believe it or not, is on evening primrose. And this is this is how they spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flower. Easy to find them. Beautiful little moth. Showy emerald on sumac. Um, and I don't mean poison sumac. I've never seen poison sumac. That's a plant of the swamp. We're talking about smooth sumac, a staghorn sumac. They're wonderful soil stabilizers. You don't have to use a non-native plant to soil stabilize your soil. Sumac does a good job. Then we have some real heavy, heavy hitters like uh, our native prunus, things like black cherry and pin cherry, American plum. Uh, they'll support the white furcula and the crocus geometer and the io moth and the beautiful cecropia moth, the colorful zaley, the tufted bird dropping moth. Again, who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? It's fun just to say the name. The paddle caterpillar. Ask your kids to go find a paddle caterpillar on black cherry and then ask them to figure out what those paddles are for. They're not decorations. They have a function. I'm not going to tell you what they're for. I want you to think about it, figure out what they're for. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these expandable filaments that, that grow and shrink. Uh, it's really fun to watch. The small-eyed sphinx, number of things on, on black cherry. Harris's three spot that has a uh, holds an umbrella of its shed exo, uh, um, head, head cuticle. Um, as an umbrella over its head. Always wonder what that was all about. It turns out it's for, for defense. If you come up and approach this caterpillar, it starts whipping these around uh, and, and wants to smack you across the face. Oaks, the most productive plant that we have uh, in 84% of the counties of North America. We'll produce things like the hag moth that thinks it's a tarantula, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, the crown bugalatrix, the half oval ancillus, the pink striped oak worm, and my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar called spun glass slugs. You know, they're not slugs, but their head is tucked up underneath and you can't see it. So people call them the slug caterpillars. Literally plus hundreds more species in our, our area. Oaks, it turns out, are keystone plants. And this is a really important concept. Probably the most important thing that we've, we've figured out in our lab in recent years. 
Um, all native plants are not equal in their ability to support food webs. There's a few, 5% that are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our, our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food. So we need to include these in our landscapes or we're going to have failed food webs. Even if the landscape is 100% native, um, it's got to be the right natives uh, included. included. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, oaks support 510 species uh, right here in, in Pennsylvania. That's 510 species of, of caterpillars and 510 species of bird food. No other plant genus comes close to that. Where did I take all the pictures I just showed you? I took them in my yard. That's what my yard looked like a few years ago when we moved in. It was mowed for hay uh, and not much there. Uh, and this is what it looked like a couple of years ago. Took this picture. Look, we've got lawn. We're very traditional here. I'm sitting in this window right up there. Uh, and I just wanted to show you, we put plants back. Not all the plants. I'm still still adding plants uh, each year when I when I get the chance. Uh, but every time I do, new species of moths come to our property, and I've made it a goal the last four years to take a picture of every species of moth uh, that uh, I could find on our our property. I'm not done, but as of right now, I have taken pictures of 1,030 species of moths. Now we own 10 acres in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we're supporting 38% of all of the moss species that occur in Pennsylvania. And each one of these is a type of bird food. So we're supporting, what is it? I think it's 40% of all terrestrial birds in, in Pennsylvania. Why do we have all this, these, these species here? It's a lot of biodiversity. Because we planted all these guys. We planted witch hazels and oaks and persimmons and American elm and red maple and all of these different things. And we're still adding plants. And we tolerated these guys. All the ones everybody says are, are weeds. Black cherry, it's a weed, you gotta get rid of it. No, you don't have to get rid of it. It's the second most important plant you can have. Native grapes, you have to make sure they don't pull your trees down because they get big and heavy. Um, so occasionally cut them back, but... Um, Tulip trees, you know, a lot of them, a lot of people don't tolerate them. Goldenrod, oh, I got to get rid of golden. Even there's a poison ivy, green briar, dotter. Every time you add these plants to your landscape, you're making it rich, more species rich. Let me just add that a couple, couple months ago, the World Wildlife Fund um, said we have lost, uh, what is it, 60% or two thirds of all the wildlife on planet Earth is now gone. All I can say is not at our house. All right, we put the plants back and I think we've increased our biodiversity by two thirds. I'm sure that, sure that we have. So it's not hopeless. We can turn this around. And every time we add those caterpillars to our yard, we also add the birds that eat them, like the wood thrush. You know, wood thrush is, it's, it's a species of the forest. Well, we put plants back and now we have enough leaf litter. That's where they really forage, that they're starting to breed here. We've got that Virginia creeper that produces the lettered sphinx. That's what that is, so that this baby can eat. We've got indigo bunnings breeding at our property because we've got alders making ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edged bomalocas. We have field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panopotas. We have tip ice because we've got black cherries making dowdy pinions. Phoebes because we have a lot of species of native grasses making skippers. We've got robins because we've got, you know, robin, they eat worms. Yeah, they eat some worms, but um, there's a lot of native low growing plants making things like the white line sphinx. And that's what they're really re uh, reproducing on. Carolina chickies because we've got tulip trees making tulip tree beauty. We've got white eyed virias because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtails. House friends because we have got hickories making copper underwings. Again, all of this happening on my property. That's where all these pictures come from. We've got bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. 50, 50 species of breeding birds on, on our property because we've got the bird food to support them. So all I'm trying to say is that by choosing the right plants, using more of them, we could restore insects nearly everywhere. I wanna leave you with nine things that you can do to restore the ecosystem in your yard by increasing insect populations. And I'm gonna start by talking about lawn. Most of you have heard me talk about lawn in the past because we got way too much of it. 40 million acres, at least. That's the size of New England, which is, it's a wonderful status symbol, but it's a deadscape. Um, the earth isn't big enough for us to take that much space for our status symbols any anymore. So I'm suggesting we cut this area in half, plant them full of those keystone plants and bring life back to our yards. I drove by this, this uh, church in Mississippi last year. Uh, and, you know, it struck me that, that people come to the church to worship all of God's creations uh, uh, on the inside, and then on the outside, they kill them all. 
we're not we're not tying the way we treat the land um, into what the consequences are. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shrink the lawn. Um, but we also have to plant for those specialist bees. And we talked about that already. We got to move the invasive species from our, from our properties. So if you have burning bush, if you have barberry, if you have porcelain berry, if you have calorie pear, if you have privet and you know, miscanthus, if you have zelkova, believe it or not, all of these things are spreading rapidly from our properties and, and polluting, biologically polluting our natural areas, reducing insect populations all the time. Um, so pick at it, get rid of one, one species a year, that'll be great. Then we wanna use those, well, these are the major, oh yeah, English ivy, don't forget that. Um, these are some of the major uh, targets for, for invasive species that we should think about you know, getting rid of on our, oh, Chinese elm, that's another one on our, our properties. Use keystone plants, we talked about that. How do you know what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and uh, herbaceous uh, native plants will pop up for your county. Now notice, ranked in terms of the number of species of caterpillars that they, they support. Um, notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, and native birches. Native. If you go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a maple, chances are really good they're going to sell you a, a Japanese maple. If you say, I want to buy a cherry, they'll sell you a, a you know, Asian cherry that's going to bloom and have pretty blooms. They'll sell you a weeping willow from, from the Middle East. Um, they might even sell you a, 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 an English oak or a, um, a Chinese oak. Specify that you want the natives because if you don't, even though these are native genera, you get a non-native members, you're going to reduce uh, caterpillar use by 65%. These three, solidago, asters, and helianthus, just those three genera alone are producing uh, or supporting more than 40 species of native bees. If you don't have them in your yard, that's 40 species gone right there. And solid, as I said, golden rice support 110 species of caterpillars, asters many as well. Landscape for caterpillars. What do I mean by that? Well, yeah, you have to add the right plants, but you also have to consider what happens on the ground underneath those plants. Uh, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, that should be 510 um, species develop on oaks. A few of them complete their development on the oak. Uh, so here's the polyphemus moth. The caterpillar eats the leaves. They spin a cocoon and hang from the, the branch and then the adult emerges and they do, do it all again. Uh, well, that is great. Uh, and I wish most of these species did that but they don't, most of them drop from the tree. 480 species that use oaks in Chester County drop from the tree, that's 94%. Wiggle beneath, beneath the ground, because the ground's gonna be soft under your tree and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. You see where I'm going with this. We don't have any leaf litter under the tree and we mow and, and trample and compact our soil so much under our plants that it's like a rock and our caterpillars cannot get underground. So this becomes a, an ecological trap and you'll recognize that this landscape is not special. You see it everywhere. The adult moths come in, lay their eggs there, the caterpillars drop down and die. And the next generation is smaller and the next generation after that is gone. I'm sure that this type of landscaping without thinking about what's underneath our trees is a major cause of insect declines. And of course the cement landscape is even less of a viable option for our caterpillars. I am not trying to discourage the use of trees in our cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of, of cement as a landscape option, it's not. I mean, and it destroys our, our watersheds. That's just laziness. This so is what most people do. They have a tree in the middle of the big lawn. Nobody studied the, the uh, survivorship uh, success of caterpillars in a situation like this, but I guarantee it is higher in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe you have a dogwood up here and then a, a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. The caterpillar drops down into a safe site. It can easily get below the ground because it's not not compacted. It's not going to be mowed. Nobody's going to step on it. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. I mean, hardy plant people, this is where you do it. Uh, and it's a great way to shrink your, your lawn um, because this, this area used to be grass. So now it's going to be a very nice bed and it's a safe site. This is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers like, like wild ginger or native pachysandra or foam flower or, or may apple. There's a lot of, lot of options there. They're all safe sites. Reduce your light pollution. You know, we're going to bring all these, these, these insects to our yard, particularly moths, and then we're going to kill them with our, our security light. 
That doesn't make any sense. Uh, it turns out a lot of a lot of research from Europe is showing that um, light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines, at least in the temperate zone around the world. And to me, that is good. That is good news because if this is a major cause of insect decline, it is also the easiest one to address. Just turn out your lights. Flick flick of a switch. It's easy. I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't do that because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your, your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is the bad man does not come very often. If you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security uh, system uh, and a mercury vapor bulb is the very worst and replace it with a yellow bulb. Yellow bulbs, particularly yellow LED lights, are the least attractive to night flying insects. If we switched out our night lights with, with yellow LED lights overnight, we could save billions of insects and a ton of energy as well. Opposed mosquito spraying. Here's Mosquito Joe. He's going around the country undoing everything that, that I talk about. And he will say, uh, well, this, is, this only kills mosquitoes. Not so. This is a pyrethroid fog and it kills all the insects it comes in, in contact with. Uh, there's a lot of people that say, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I am landscaping for insects at my house, but my, my neighbor sprays for mosquitoes and I don't have any monarchs. So I don't have anything else. I said, that's right, because this stuff, this floats. It doesn't stay on, on your neighbor's property. It's a serious problem. And it's, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a couple of people that had Zika virus show up in Florida. The virus never got established in Florida. It never got established any other place in the U.S., but it really boosted this, this industry. So now all over the country, New York City, every place, everybody's fogging for mosquitoes so they don't get Zika virus, which isn't here. Camden, New Jersey, mandatory fogging so that we don't get malaria. You know the last time we had a malaria in Camden? I don't either, but it was hundreds of years ago. We're, just, we're not thinking. They also say, well, this is a... a uh, it's a natural product, so it's okay. Well, it is a natural product. It comes from plants, but so does cyanide come from plants. It doesn't mean it's okay, it's not. The way to control mosquitoes is in the larval stage. I know they're annoying, I know that. Most of the annoying ones, by the way, are uh, invasive species themselves. Aedes aegypti, where's that from? Egypt. Uh, Asian tiger mosquito, where's that from? You get a bucket, fill it full of water, put straw or hay in there and let it ferment for a couple of days. That becomes uh, an irresistible place for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. <clears throat> so they lay their eggs, they hatch in about, uh, I don't know, some of them hatch really fast. Then you put in a mosquito dunk that you get at the hardware store. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, and it is it targets aquatic diptera. So you put that in there, the larvae hatch, they chew on this little, little uh, nungi here and and it kills them and it kills only them. So people say, "Can what if my dog licks it? That's okay, this is, that doesn't harm uh, vertebrates at all. Um, and you know, this is in a bucket. You're not throwing this in aquatic systems where you're gonna kill other, other, other aquatic diptera. If everybody did this, we'd have far fewer mosquitoes and it's a whole lot cheaper than mosquito gel. As a matter of fact, minimize insecticide use overall. Homeowners use a tremendous amount of insecticide. If you don't believe me, go to Lowe's or, or your nearest uh, nursery and look at the shelves. It's loaded with the poisons that we like to put out um, as if we needed them. The only thing that you, know, you really can't ignore is if you have termites, you have to have a professional treat them. But the other insect problems we have aren't problems. Um, so let's learn to be a little bit more, more tolerant and stop living, stop creating, um, envelopes of poison that we ourselves live in. That cannot be good. Finally, uh, people say, I can't do anything you're saying because my homos association has these very strict rules and I have to use non-native plants and I have to have very short grass and, and so on. That's true. They do have uh, these, these rules. They were established mostly in the 70s when, when neighborhoods got tired of people having uh, old, old cars in their front yard. Um, so they made rules. Uh, we're a high status community and, and so we're all going to follow these, these rules. Okay, I understand that. Again, status is really important to humans, but they knew nothing about uh, the ecological roles our landscapes needed to start playing. So let's change those rules. We can still be high status and, and um, still support the life around us. How's the, how are you going to do that? Let's infiltrate, join them. If everybody who understand these relationships were the members on the homeowners association, uh, we'd make reasonable rules.
Okay, I'm going to close uh, the way I started with um, E.O. Wilson. In 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. Uh, he, you know, he's desperate. He's, he's getting old. He's 92 now, I think. Um, and he really wants to save life on Earth. He loves it. We all do. Uh, so he, he said, if we don't save ecosystem function, preserve ecosystem function on half of the planet, all of it is going to go. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that. And then he ended the book. What he didn't talk about is how can we how can we do this? How can we save ecosystem function on half the earth? Remember, half the earth is already in agriculture. And if you don't replace that, and I'm not sure how we would do that, you got to focus on the other half where we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people, all of our infrastructure, the Denver airport that's twice the size of Manhattan, all of these places are in that other half. How are we going to have ecosystem function there? I think we can do it. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation. The old approach of having humans here in nature someplace else isn't going to work. There isn't some, there's not a third half of the earth where we can, we can have functioning ecosystem. So we have to save nature where there are a lot of humans. We all have to learn to coexist. It doesn't mean you have to save insects for a living, but you really can. You really should think about saving them where you live. You know, insect decline is a global problem, but it has a grassroots solution. If everybody on the planet assumed their, their uh, role as, as um, earth stewards, everybody's got a role as an earth steward. Who's going to get a pass? Everybody needs good uh, uh, functioning ecosystems. So everybody should have the responsibility for it. If we all did that, we wouldn't have global insect decline and we wouldn't have the sixth grade extinction. We wouldn't have many of the problems that we have. Think about it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for these very, very important messages and your exquisite photography. I can answer one question right off the bat that yes, that, that incredible photography was taken by Doug. And thank you for taking care of the question about um, mosquitoes. That was covered. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> um, we do have quite a bit of questions and I can tell by some of them that they might um, involve a not a quick answer. So what I did everybody is I put in my chat box, my email jjenneyy one at swathmore.edu. And I would say, please hold back at any more questions. If you, um, if there's one that we haven't got to, or we don't get to yours here, please feel free to email me and I'll see what I can do to get an answer for you next week. But um, I will jump over to Mandy and Mandy, I'll say, why don't we see if we can, um, the next 10 minutes or so, how many questions we can get through and we'll try to wrap things up here around uh, 3.30. So thanks again, Doug and Mandy, I'll hand it over to you to ask Doug some questions. Great, okay. thank you, Julie. That was so interesting, Doug. So um, we'll start right at the top here in the chat. Um, here's the first question. I have a ton of celosia in my yard. I know it is non-native, have tons of bumblebees and others all over them. Is Celosia okay, even though it is non-native? Okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you put a hummingbird feeder up in your yard, hummingbirds come. The hummingbird feeder is not a native plant either, but it's supplying nectar, which the hummingbirds use. That's the same with these non-native plants. A lot of them produce a lot of nectar. That's why butterfly bush, it's not native, but it produces a lot of nectar and a lot of butterflies go there and they get to drink nectar. But what they're, those are the generalist pollinators that I'm talking about. Bumblebees are mostly generalized pollinators and they will take nectar from wherever they can get their little tongues into. Uh, and, and it's great, it helps the bumblebees, but wouldn't it be better to have the plants that help the bumblebees and the specialist bees instead of having a yard that excludes all those specialists, which is about 1300 species of bees, um, let's plant in, in a more diversified way so that we, we take care of our specialists as well. Thank you. Um, so where do beetles fit in? Uh, beetles, uh, there are more species of beetles uh, than any other type of insects. There are more species of beetles than any other type of multicellular organism, although the nematode people would argue with that. Uh, so the good question, where do beetles fit in? Typically hiding. 
beetles develop as larvae where they're the most palatable. You know, adult beetles are like little tanks. They're filled, they're, they're very tough, a lot of exoskeleton, which is undigestible and a lot of sharp edges. So they're not high on, on the food web of a lot of, of creatures. Uh, they're, they're mammals like shrews will specialize on, on beetles, particularly scarabs. They, they, um, they gather them up during the, the night and then they eat them during the day. But um, by and large, at, particularly when they're developing, beetles are masters of the subsurface habitat. They're boring in logs or hiding in seeds or eating roots uh, out of sight and out of, of, you know, they're not available for a lot of the things that want to eat them. Uh, and that's why in terms of, of supporting food webs, they're just not as important. Great, thank you. Um, so many of the photos showed moths on lichen. Any reason for this? <laughs> I'm trying to be artistic. <laughs> I get a branch with a, with a lichen growing. I say, hey, doesn't that look pretty? That's the only reason. You know? <laughs> there are, I shouldn't say that. There are many moths that look exactly like lichens and they seek them out so that you can't see them. Uh, but I go crazy with that. Maybe, all right, that, I better stop doing that so people don't ask me. <laughs> So uh, let's see, we own two acres in a community in Northern New Jersey and there's a seasonal pool on my property. My next door neighbor owns four acres, which a good acre is covered with a phragmite and still grass, which is heading towards the pool. Any suggestions? Mm. Okay, that's phragmites and that's, that is, you know, it's a non-native genotype from, from Europe. Big problem, you don't want it to get established in your, so you've got a vernal pool I assume it probably gets really low or disappears during the summer. And, and that's a really important resource. I'll bet you have salamanders and wood frogs and other things that depend entirely on that pool. So you want to protect it. Um, stilt grass, huge, huge problem. I, I, I do not know of anybody who knows how to control stilt grass without herbicide. You can put a pre-emergent on, on the area that you want to control and, and stilt grass is an annual so it won't you know, it won't germinate that year, but um, it's everywhere. And its seeds are, are spread by a lot of things, including deer. So um, keep it away from your, your, your pool. And that means manual labor. Um, don't, use, don't use herbicides or insecticides around your pool. They'll get into the water and make, you know, then you've got a little toxic dump. You don't want that. Uh, but if you, if Phragmite starts to come up near it, you can exhaust the root system by cutting it back repeatedly. And I mean repeatedly, like every two weeks. Uh, and so never let it get, uh, you know, this giant, giant mass. You've got to be religious about it. And that exhausts the root system. And so if, if there's any area of the frag part that you can mow, that's a great way to cut it back. Just keep mowing it and that, that will kill it. Um, but just be vigilant. If it's not there now, it could be that it's too shaded to support it. These things like sun. Um, I don't have a silver bullet for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Some good suggestions, though. Um, how do you maintain a bee hotel? I've seen carpenter bees and wasps in them. If there's a dark col color on the edges now, how should I get rid of it? Or, or should I get rid of it? I'm sorry, if there's a dark color on the edges. Well, carpenter bees, that's one of the things you want in your bee hotels, you know, because they, they, they reproduce in wood. There's a large carpenter bee and, the, and a small one, little teeny green one, they'll use different size holes. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. Uh, right now, if it's plugged up, it is, it's got larvae in there or, or pre, pre uh, pupae that will pupate in the spring and then emerge as adults. So after watch it and and say okay these ones you might put a little dot with with your you know your magic marker there say this one is occupied if if you look later in the spring and it's open it means it has emerged and it's and it's gone that's when you clean it out after after it is gone um, but that's a real good question because if you start cleaning out things you never know who's in there and and uh, it might be I don't want to make it hard, but it might be easiest just to simply put that one aside and get a brand new one for this year. And, and after a couple of years, do it again, because because um, there were repeated generations of these things and there's there's no guaranteed time when there's nobody home and you don't want to kill them just to clean it out. Yeah, good question. 
Um, so this is geared towards um, big agriculture. So are there new developments directed towards agriculture, either lands for livestock grazing or crop production that can help promote native pollinators? Or are we limited to promoting native insects in our non-agriculture yards and homes? Is there anything I can tell farmers to do? For example, planting natives at the edges of fields, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, the global insect decline has focused a lot on industrial agriculture. Uh, so it's, it's on people's radar screens. Uh, it wasn't that long ago when most farms had hedgerows. And it wasn't that long ago when most of those hedgerows were all native plants. Right away, you've, you've, that's a huge boost to biodiversity on your property. Then all the hedgerows were, were autumn olive. And as long as people planted autumn olive as, as a hedgerow. Uh, and other, other non-natives, and they just became sources for invasives. But the latest trend, and this is here, but it's also largely in the Midwest with the great big corn and soybean belts, is the high status farmer has gotten rid of all of its weeds, the milkweeds and the esters and all the things that support the monarchs and the bumblebees and the, and the native bees along the edges of their property, sprayed them with Roundup and planted grass. So now they mow it and it's, it is a biological desert. For, for thousands of square miles in the in the you know in the Midwest, that none of that is necessary. You do not need to spray the weeds on the side of your corn when there's zero weeds from your your Roundup inside the corn or your soybeans. That doesn't boost your your um, you know your final uh, your bottom line at all. As a matter of fact, it costs you more to do that. Uh, so returning the quote weeds, all those native plants, to the edges of our ag fields would again that would promote uh, particularly pollinators there are there's good research going on in iowa and a few other places having actual pollinator strips right in the middle of the fields that uh, if you if you orient them um, perpendicular to the flow of water when it rains hard it intercepts a lot of soil so it saves it saves topsoil uh, and it's also you're not talking about a huge area here so it doesn't reduce yield very much and it also it's a great source for for pollinators so all these things are, are being looked at uh, and um, you know one of the major reasons that the the uh, house sparrow and the um, starling are disappearing in England is because of industrial agriculture uh, and and even suburbs where they've gotten rid of all of their their hedges and their their hedgerows. So put those areas back, and these things will will come back. These these are solvable problems. Okay, so um, where do ground nesting native bees go in the winter? In the ground, they that's where they're they're going to overwinter. Um, so their you know their little holes get plugged up, and you don't even forget that they're there. If you know, if you've got a site where the ground nesting bees are nesting, uh, try not to walk on it a whole lot or at all. Um, don't spend a lot of time mowing it. I mean, leave that section alone. It's usually not a big section. I've got several places on our property, but they're, you know, each one is maybe two or three square feet. It's not, not a huge area, uh, but they're down there, um, you know, eight, 10 inches, uh, most of the time below the frost line. And that's where they're spending the winter. So what if you don't know if they're, so this person was writing about, they had had them in a planter, then they took the planter away. Mm. Um, and then when they brought it back, they started to see them again, but they were wondering where, they didn't know where they were during the time. The planter. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in the soil in the planter and it's probably a new crop that is using it because it's really easy to dig in. So they're, they're in the soil. So another follow-up question on the bee hotels. Um, somebody asked what size holes are needed. It depends on the species of the bee. So remember those pictures I showed you, there's all different size holes, uh, but um, a typical hole uh, three eighths inch is gonna uh, meet the needs of a lot of species of bees. Perfect. Um, can you provide some tips on how to find these caterpillars and moths, um, et cetera? I have most of the plants he's recommended, but struggle to actually see these critters. Yeah, they don't want you to find them. They're very good at hiding. Uh, so you develop what we call a search image. You have to you have to say, how are they hiding? A lot of them look like uh, curled edges of leaves. They look like leaf damage. Um, many caterpillars are hiding during the day and only come out to eat at night. So a, a good way is at the end of July and early August, 
walk around with a flashlight at night and fly, sign it up in your trees and you will see caterpillars. You'll see them hanging down uh, on silken threads from leaves. Every time a parasitoid gets on a leaf and tries to sting one of them, they drop from the leaf and hang on a, a, a little thread. Uh, and that's very easy to see at night. Uh, but during the day, they'll go up on the stems often and blend in with the stem or they hide in the bark. And some of them make long trips. They crawl off the tree all together and then come back during the day. Uh, so, you know, I showed you a lot of pictures of caterpillars. I did not take all those pictures in one day. I, I stumble across one and take the picture, but um, they're doing their best. Remember, birds are really good at finding these caterpillars. So they've got to hide really well or they're dead. And look underneath a leaf as opposed to on top of it, they're always gonna be underneath hiding so that the bird can't see them or roll up in a, in a leaf. Nighttime exploring, very cool. Um, so this is about your um, book and um, they asked, it says your book makes reference to having a home ecological audit, but who offers this service? <laughs> um, some groups are doing it like the, the uh, uh, Delaware Nature Society here in, in Delaware uh, has a service where they will come to your house and they'll, they'll do exactly that. I think National Wildlife Federation uh, has the same service in different areas, uh, but it's, you know, it's very local and, you, and, and we don't have enough of it for sure. What we really don't have enough of are the ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners who can, most people don't garden. They just hire somebody, they hire a lawn service or they just hire somebody. And, and I would love to see that uh, that niche career explode where, you know, there's a whole list of people advertising their services so that you don't have to worry about which species of plant is there. Just tell them to, you know, make my yard alive and they'll do it and they'll do it in a way that looks good and they'll, then they'll maintain it because none of this is maintenance free. Um, but we don't have enough of that right now. This is, you know, this is, this is new folks, we haven't been talking about this very long and people are just starting to train to do it. If you're young and you're looking for a good career, this is a good one because every place I go, when I used to go, people say, who can I hire? I say, I don't know. <laughs> you know so, so it is a wide open niche in a lot of places. So I think we're gonna do our last two questions here. Um, is mulch good or bad? <laughs> um, the best mulch is the leaf litter that falls on your property. You know, the, the watershed managers have told us, we don't want any water leaving your property. It rains, it all has to stay there. So landscape in a way that stays there. We wanna do the same thing with leaves. Any leaf that falls in your property should stay there. I know it can't stay where you're gonna have lawn because it'll kill the lawn eventually, but you have to put it in, in places. Um, my son bought a new house, a couple, couple uh, a couple years ago. And he, in the fall, he called me up. He said, dad, I've got way too many leaves. I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. That's how you shrink your lawn. You build flower beds around your trees and you can, you can suppress the, the green, uh, the grass growth with those leaves. That returns the nutrients to the soil in a natural way. All kinds of things live in that, live in that leaf litter. And you can plant right through it. You can have your, your plants come up. You want to have your, your land, your ground planted so well that you don't need a lot of mulch. If you don't have leaves and you don't have plants, should you buy bark mulch? Bare ground is the worst. So yes, bark mulch is better than bare ground, but leaves are much better than bark mulch. All right, good advice. Julie, do we have time for one final question? I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I was giving the thumbs up, but I realized you probably didn't see that. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my little question part was covering you. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, so here's our final one. Um, could you comment on invasive insects? Here in Vermont, we're seeing a lot of Asian lady be beetles and marmorated stink bugs. Do they displace native insects and their ecological function? Yes, in both cases. Uh, I've talked about making insects native insects. We don't want any non-native. We don't want any invasive insects. We don't want Japanese beetles. We don't want winter moth. We don't want satin moth. We don't want gypsy moth. We don't want emerald ash borer. We don't want hemlock woolly adelgid. These things are devastating our natural areas because they come here without their natural enemies, without their the things that, that um, 
particularly their parasitoids and without the diseases that, that control them. So they go crazy. You know, they're not evil inherently. It's that they have been immediately without any evolutionary adaptation taken from one continent and put, in, put it on another one. Um, so they cause huge problems and, and we do not want them. That's, that's for sure. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I saw Julie furiously writing down some questions. <laughs> yes, but I didn't get to them all. And unfortunately, the question and answer section is not saved. So Michael Kirchner, Holly Weiss, um, and the anonymous attendee who put in your last question, if you're still on, please email your questions to me at jjennney1 at swathmore.edu. Um, you should all actually have my email because I'm the one who sent you the reminder email with the link today. So again, if we did not get to your questions, I see they're still coming in, but we unfortunately are not going to be able to answer all of them. And so just send them to me and I'll see what I can do this week about getting them answered for you. Uh, but thank you, Nora. Thank you, Mandy and Doug. Thank you again for giving us such important information. And one thing I will say is if we didn't get to your questions, read Doug's books. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> you read the read his books, go to his website, um, tons of wonderful information out there for you to continue learning these really important messages. And um, not only will you learn the answer to your question, but um, it'll remind you of all the important things you said today and you'll learn more things. And again, we did record the session today. So the question to repeat what he was saying about mosquitoes is at the end. So we will get that to you as, as soon as we can and you can watch it again and maybe your questions will be answered through that as well. So, and thank you to the Hardy Plant Society. Um, we have had Doug speak for us uh, before at the Scott Arboretum, but the Hardy Plant Society, it was their idea to bring him here today to reach all of you. So I appreciate everybody's time and on this Sunday to, to join in. And Doug, thanks again uh, for your time and, and willing to do a, a webinar for us. And um, well, thanks I'm for sure, listening, everybody. I'm sure we'll have you back and I'm sure you'll still bring in 500 people for us. So. Yeah, I hope I'm still here. <laughs> thanks again. Right. And uh, looking forward to seeing